a giraffe is the tallest animal on Earth, literally a head above the rest. The height of an adult giraffe averages 18 feet. Keep that in mind. It may be useful later. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to give you the wide-angle view on science and technology. The ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland are the world's principal storehouses for ice. Now they are returning that ice to the sea. Oceans continue to rise, with an estimated increase in this century of two feet or more. Some coastal cities are drowning already. But it wasn't always like this. Archaeologists tell us that humans once were able to adapt to rising waters. So what happened? In this episode, rising oceans, ancient civilizations, and whether engineering can keep the waters at bay. It's new water worlds. The science is clear. The world's ice is melting and sea levels are rising. In the last century, the rise has been about six inches. Also, and importantly, we've been able to measure the change in the rate at which ice is melting, and it's accelerating. These are facts, and the science is certain. However, estimates vary about by how much more the seas will rise. The estimated rise by century's end is between two feet and six and a half feet. It depends on both the rate of acceleration of ice melt and the steps we take to curb global warming. But if the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets were to collapse, events that could be triggered by the loss of glaciers holding the ice sheets back, and by the way, that's no longer an outlier scenario, a massive amount of ice would dump into the ocean. The seas would rise not by two feet or six feet, but 10 feet or more. And that estimate is conservative when compared to a dramatic scenario that researchers published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in August 2018. If average temperatures climb beyond the proposed limit of 2 degrees Celsius, it could create a tipping point that propels Earth into a hothouse state, triggering as much as 33 to 200 feet sea level rise. If you have trouble picturing what 200 feet is, well, think of that 18-foot giraffe that I mentioned earlier. Imagine taking 10 of the tallest giraffes you can find and stacking them vertically. That's about 200 feet. Now, we don't know how high the seas will rise this century, but we do know that they will continue to rise. The water will come, is journalist Jeff Goodell's account of his travels researching the consequences of sea level rise. In it, Mr. Goodell allows himself to imagine how unchecked ocean waters would affect a coastal city like Miami. Still, the water kept rising nearly a foot each decade. Each big storm devoured more of the coastline, pushing the water deeper and deeper into the city. The skyscrapers that had gone up during the boom years were gradually abandoned and used as staging grounds for drug runners and exotic animal traffickers. Crocodiles nested in the ruins of the Frost Museum of Science. Still, the waters kept rising. By the end of the 21st century, Miami had become something else entirely, a popular diving spot where people could swim among sharks and barnacled SUVs and explore the wreckage of a great American city. The image of a submerged and sunken Miami is startling, but it may be surprising to hear that this imagined fate for the city is not exclusive to modern climate change science. It goes at least as far back as the era of poodle skirts and skinny neckties. The description of a flooded Miami made its way to television in the 1950s. An episode of the Bell Science Hour series, directed by Frank Capra, yes, that Frank Capra, addressed weather and climate change, the physics of which was already understood. In it, a scientist named Mr. Research describes the detrimental effects of burning fossil fuel to the naive Mr. Writer. Even now, Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. So, yes, the science of climate change was understood in the 1950s, 
But will tourists really one day check out Miami and glass-bottom boats? Who knows? Although it's not unusual to hear of people paddling kayaks in downtown Miami today when the tide is high. But for many low-lying coastal cities, the prospect of rising seas is no longer a future tense scenario. Jeff, you began with a fantasy description of what cities Miami perhaps will look like underwater, but you have been to Miami when it really was flooded during the King Tides, and I wonder if you could describe what it was like. Well, I went to Miami first after Hurricane Sandy hit New York, and I began thinking about the implications of water coming into a city and what that meant. And some scientists suggested that I go look at Miami because they pointed out it was a very vulnerable city. And I went down there during the annual King Tides in November. And what was shocking to me was the amount of water. I was in Miami Beach at the time. The amount of water that just came into the city on just a normal high tide. I was walking through streets where condos were selling for $10 million, and I was up to my knees in water. And the entire city was sort of grappling with the sudden flooding. And it was just what was striking to me was not just wading through the water, but stopping to think for one moment about what the implications would be for even just one or two feet of sea level rise, much less five or six or seven or eight in a city like Miami, which is so low, so flat, so much real estate built right on the water, and most of all, built on a kind of um, porous limestone substrate that's basically like Swiss cheese, so that you can't really build walls. And it became very clear to me really quickly that if you take climate change at all seriously, Miami as we know it today is sort of a doomed city. What is the difference between a normal tide and a king tide? And are Miami residents used to these king tides? Are they exceptionally high tides? King tide is a loose term. There's no technical meaning for it other than the sort of highest tide of the year that happens because of the alignment of the moon and the same reasons that drive tides in general. But a confluence of factors usually there's a spring king tide and a fall king tide, and usually the fall king tide is the highest tide of the year, and it usually lasts four or five days back and forth. And yes, Miami residents are very keenly aware of this. They sort of live in rhythm with this, with the tides, especially the king tides, where they have been experiencing each year, each spring and each fall, you know, increased flooding, more and more flooding, and a rising sense that we need to do something about this, and what are we going to do? You know, you said when you were in Miami, you really got a sense of what could happen when the waters rise. But in your book, you describe the moment when it really crystallized for you, the profound connection between the melting ice and sea level rise came when you were in Greenland. Why did it take a trip to Greenland for that to really hit home for you? So I've been writing about climate change more or less exclusively for 18 years now. And I've talked to many scientists, I've been many places, but what's really hard even for someone like me who has spent so much time thinking about the science of this and the politics of this too, is understanding the connectedness of it all. That this is not, when we talk about sea level rise, that is not a thing unto itself. It is part of this large system. The wildfires are connected to this. The droughts, all of this is, you know, one big system, what, you know, the scientist James Lovelock called the sort of Gaia idea of this positive and negative feedback, this almost living organism. And that's what I felt in Greenland. Uh, we landed in a helicopter on this sort of new piece of land that Jason Box, the scientist I was with, said had probably not been exposed to daylight in 15,000 years or something. And we could watch the Jakobshavn glacier calving into the, into the sea there from right where we were. And it was very profound because I was looking at the glaciers calving there and, and thinking about these enormous ice sheets and, and realizing that this is what is flooding Miami. What's happening here on this glacier at this moment in Greenland right now has profound implications. And of course, not just for Miami. I just made that connection because I was there, but also for Bangladesh and for China and for the Marshall Islands, many places around the world. But it was a memorable moment for me. One of the descriptions of what's happening in Miami now, or at least in the neighborhoods of Miami, that has really stayed with me and will stay with anyone if they read it in your book, and it's an example of the infrastructure that is so vulnerable, is the waste management system, and specifically the septic tanks, and why they're so vulnerable. 
I wonder if you could describe that in as much detail as you'd like to. <laughs> well, this is one of the things about sea level rise and this flooding problems with cities that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, sometimes when people think about rising waters, even in places like Miami, they think, oh, it's just more water. We like the water. We like the coast. We like Biscayne Bay. It'll just be like more water. What's so wrong with that? But the problem is, is this is not going to be happy, clean water you're going to want to be swimming in. And the septic tank problem is emblematic of that. So in Miami-Dade County and in many places around the country, you know, you have two ways of disposing of, of sewage. Basically, you have municipal sewage systems where you have pipes that go out to a big mainline pipe that go out to a treatment plant. And those are relatively resilient to flooding because the except for the lines that go from the house sometimes get rotted out. But those, those work pretty well. But, you know, in Miami-Dade and in most other cities, you still have large populations that use septic tanks in their yards, in the backyard, and septic tanks, as anyone who's ever been around one knows, they're basically, you know, a, a tank that has these leach lines that go out and kind of dissipate the bacteria into the soil. And even a modest amount of flooding carries all that bacteria and everything out into the floodwaters. And, and it's, it's a clever system because then if it, when it works properly, that soil acts as a filter. Right. And it works great and had been building septic systems for hundreds of years and they were a big public health improvement once they figured out the simple techniques of how to deal with this. So in any city where there's any kind of flooding, what happens is you immediately get runoff of this bacteria into the floodwaters. And so even now, when I was in Miami, you know, a year and a half ago, I went out with this scientist into, and it, it's mostly in sort of lower income neighborhoods where um, there was flooding in the streets in this region of, of Miami where you had water that was, you know, at high tides, maybe um, two feet deep in the streets of this neighborhood. And he was there to sample the bacterial content. And it was like 3,000 times higher than the public health limits. And you had kids out there riding their bikes through it and playing in it. And, you know, the public health risks of this are enormous. And this is one of the big risks that even modest amounts of sea level rise. So one of the things that's hard to communicate is that you know, sea level rise is a problem long before you have, you know, sharks swimming through the lobby of the Hilton Hotel, right? It's like even small increments of more flooding, higher flooding, you get more of this problems of septics, drainage problems, more corrosion, all these kinds of incremental things that are a very big deal. Now, you use a phrase in your writing, which is the equilibrium with the sea, well, Miami indeed is a strong example of a city that has lost that equilibrium. Can you give us an overview of why this city is so vulnerable? Well, three main things. One is that it's very flat. 70% of Miami-Dade County and most of South Florida is less than six feet above sea level right now. And a lot of everything south of Miami is even lower, three feet or less. So it doesn't take much to flood that. So one thing is that it's very flat. Second thing is, is that there's been a lot of real estate development. The story of Florida is basically a story of real estate development. That's, that's what the narrative of modern Florida really is. And a lot of the structure has built, been built right on the water. No thinking about risks for this kind of thing about flooding or anything like that. And then the third thing is that it's built on a particular kind of limestone that's porous that allows the water to pass through it. So if you try to build a seawall like you might do, say, in New York, it doesn't really work because the water will go right underneath the wall and come up the other side. So there's no real way to keep the water out and to build a kind of defense system that where there is in other cities. And then there's the politics. You know, you have a governor who has banned the words climate change from government communication. I mean, so you can't even have a conversation about how to deal with this in any kind of holistic way. I mean, there's certainly activists in South Florida. There's the mayor of South Miami uh, is very outspoken. Uh, there are a number of outspoken political leaders there, but without the sort of broader political framework to have a discussion about it, it's very hard to make any progress in the direction of like, okay, here's reality. Water is coming. What are we going to do? How are we going to think differently about how we build the city? Journalist Jeff Goodell's description of Miami today may also be the fate, of course, of Bangladesh and other coastal cities, as well as island states such as Kiribati, and more water is coming. 
Scientists say not only that Antarctica is melting faster than we thought, with a tripling in the rate of ice loss over five years between 2012 and 2017, but they announced in August 2018 that for the first time in recorded history, the oldest and thickest sea ice in the Arctic has started to break up. This dramatic event has opened up waters in Greenland that are normally frozen even in summer. Rising waters threatened to wipe some cities off the map, but human civilization didn't always play a game of chicken with the ocean. Coming up, how we once lived in harmony with the seas and what it would take to do it again. Plus, will NASA have to abandon its launch pads at Cape Canaveral? It's New Water Worlds on Big Picture Science. Humans have always been drawn to coastal areas, whether oceans or rivers, but if you gaze upon today's colossal steel and glass urban landscapes, you might imagine that permanence was always the hallmark of civilization. One of the big sort of insights I had reporting this book was that the problem that we're facing with sea level rise is basically rooted in this idea that our boundaries of our world are fixed, that the water is here and the land is here. And just because it's been that way since we were a little kid, that's how it will always be. And we have no sense that these boundaries can really change. In reporting for his book, The Water Will Come, journalist Jeff Goodell learned that our modern notion of staying put is a relatively recent one and not even universally shared today. I went to see some of the ruins of the first American tribes, the Calusa, who lived in South Florida, who built these shell middens and lived in this sort of primitive Venice with these canals and things. And, you know, when the water would rise or there were storms, they could build their middens higher or they could move them and they built sophisticated drainage works. And they didn't have this notion that we're living in a fixed place. Their community was moving all the time. And I had a similar feeling when I was in Lagos, Nigeria, when I was spending some time in the water slums there where there's three or 400,000 people who live on the water, on houses essentially on stilts. And when I talk to them about storm surges or sea level rise, they're like, I don't care. We can raise our houses four feet in an afternoon. You know, we, we don't have this idea that we've poured a concrete foundation and, you know, and all that. And they're very adaptable and flexible to it all. So I think that in a certain way, all the risks that we're seeing from sea level rise and these changing boundaries are a very modern problem. And it's a kind of revenge against the modern, the idea that just because we built a building there and the water has been six feet away from it, it's always going to be six feet away from it. Well, if our predicament today is a revenge against the modern, let's get perspective by heading in the opposite direction of time zero. I'm Brian Fagan. I'm an archaeologist, and I write general books for the public about the past. One of his many books is The Attacking Ocean, the Past, Present, and Future of Rising Sea Levels. Dr. Fagan reminds us why human civilization has almost always begun on a coast. In a world which is interconnected by trade and all kinds of other things, the primary way of moving goods, everything from cars to grain, is by ship. Therefore, cities on the water, in safe ports, on estuaries, are absolutely vital to this trade. Early civilizations were able to adapt to changes in water level. The ancient Egyptians, of course, lived in harmony with the flooding of the Nile, planting harvests around the annual flood deposit of rich sediment. Perhaps less well known is the story of the inhabitants of Doggerland. Today, their land is under the North Sea. But during the last ice age, 15,000 years ago, it was an inhabited marshland and a hub of human activity. Doggerland is the flooded North Sea between England and the continent. It was dry land during the last ice age, say 15,000 years ago. It was dry land, but it was very swampy and wet. Then the sea levels rose about 300 feet till about 6000 BC when they stabilized to near modern levels. At the time, and we know this from finds from the bottom of the North Sea, 
it was inhabited by bands of hunters and fishers in small groups. So if the water rose, and literally it rose so fast that the landscape would change in someone's life expectancy of, say, 28, it would change. The only defense they had was to move, and mobility was the one they used, and they gradually moved onto higher ground. Okay. And by 5500 BC, the North Sea was water. So within, if you will, the recent history of Homo sapiens, I mean, if you're talking 10 or 15,000 years, that, that isn't very long ago compared to the, the 300,000 year history of Homo sapiens. In, in relatively recent times, you could walk from where Berlin is to where London is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so there were people living in that area that connected what was then the peninsula of Britain. So these people had to adapt to the fact that their entire landscape, if you will, where they were living was going to go underwater. They could see it happening, but there were only 10,000 people, so they could just walk out of the problem, right? They could walk out of the problem. Their second nature was mobility. They followed the movements of game. They jumped into dugout canoes and caught fish at certain times of the year, and so on and so forth. This was as much part of their lives as eating. But as the population rose, territories got more circumscribed, particularly when they got on higher ground. And then a whole set of other problems developed. Because if you have circumscribed territory, you tend to have more permanent settlements, and for the first time you're anchored to your land. So this is an example of a society that could adapt to rising water levels, dramatically rising water levels. What does it mean to be mobile? I'll give you the classic example. The toolkit, and they are not on the ocean, but this gives you it, the number of tools owned by the average sand hunter-gatherer in the desert in southern Africa 50 years ago, when they were still doing this, was 24 artifacts. How many objects do you have at home? <laughs> I think no. it's more than 24. Yeah, but you, that's, the, that's the biggest thing about mobility. You have to be mobile and portable. That mobility can def be defined by a dugout canoe, but you've got to be mobile, and you've got to be able to carry it. And the people who went to the higher ground were successful. They stayed there. They continued to hunt and fish on higher ground. They must have relied more on hunting and food gathering, and eventually they took up agriculture. And the big thing about all of this was that it was simply people adapting to new circumstances. So how would you view our situation today? Or, I mean, we're, we're facing rising waters. What are we going to do? It's a very complex issue which involves the silent elephant in the climatic room, which is population growth. And the modern era of having to cope with sea levels really began with the Industrial Revolution, with the growth of urbanization and international trade the development of the British Empire, the whole bit. And what happened then was you got increasingly dense populations close to the water by estuaries and so on. Why? Coastal ports. Because in those days without railroads, the cheapest way to move anything was by water. The reason there were such big cities by the coasts is that the infrastructure and the governance and the organization of and support of this trade requires large numbers of people living to the coast. A lot of people like living by the ocean. It tends to be cooler and it gives you access to a broader world. And I don't know the exact figure now, but I think a couple of billion people live right close to the ocean and many of them are highly endangered. So it sounds like what you're saying is, whereas it wasn't terribly hard for the Doggerland folk to just you know, move out of the way, and they had plenty of time to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly we're confronted with sea level rise that's much shorter in terms of its time scale. We have many, many more people, and, uh, you know, these, these networks of trade and so forth are all in place. I mean, is it possible for us to do what, uh, you know, Doggerlanders did? No, it isn't. There were too many of us. Let's face it, you cannot move a city of five million people without an enormous adjustment of government resources and of people's thinking to do it. And if you're looking at moving an entire huge city, you're facing a number of problems. One, the economic impact on people who have paid big money 
for coastline properties. You've also got the problem of moving people who are really attached to farmland, maybe several generations. You've got people with very strong historical links to a city. And ultimately, although the whole issue of sea level rise is a global problem, and it's a long-term problem, and the biggest thing to me is we better start thinking on the long term about this. And that's very hard for us to take because as humans, ever since the beginning, we've always reacted to things when they've happened. We can't afford to do that anymore. How would you say in general, Brian, that cultures have reacted to the ups and downs of, of sea level? It all depends on the scale of the society. In many societies, small-scale societies, it's just part of adjusting. Oh, the sea level has risen, we'll move our canoes away. Or there is less water here, but there is water there, we'll move. That's one end of the scale. The other one is Shanghai, Miami, whatever, where they say, oh my goodness, the sea levels are rising, it's flooding the streets. What do we do? The immediate reaction is to build sea defenses. Then the thinking gets longer term, realizing how expensive that is, and you look at other expensive alternatives. Whatever you do now, the big difference is there are lots of people, many more, more coming, and to move us requires long-term thinking and a lot of money and no climatic change denial. Well, finally, Brian, as an archaeologist, uh, you're used to considering the big picture, the long-term picture. Um, if you had to imagine what lifestyle might be in, a, in an urban setting, say, a couple of hundred years from now, what would you imagine? <laughs> you do ask interesting and difficult questions. Uh, one thing is absolutely certain, the populations will be more dense, and there's going to be a huge emphasis on high-density living, which means going up because the amount of land available, if sea levels rise, is going to be less. You're going to have people moving away from rivers. You're probably going to have a heavy investment, you've got to, in rapid transit. I think the days of the urban car are probably limited, and this will be very difficult. You stop building condominiums at sea level. Brian Fagan, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Brian Fagan is an archaeologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he is the author of many books, including The Attacking Ocean, The Past, Present, and Future of Rising Sea Levels. So the inhabitants of Doggerland survived because they got out, and there weren't very many of them, I think uh, on the order of 10,000 we heard. And we can assume that they didn't have a lot of stuff. No, they presumably did not have a lot of personal possessions. And the key in that was mobility, mobility. Yes. Mobility, mobility. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and they, they, I'm not even sure they had the wheel if you're talking about this long ago. But on the other hand, uh, even if you don't have the wheel and you don't have a lot of stuff, if you don't have a grand piano or whatever else to move, you know, it's probably something you can do. While we turn to the past for inspiration on how to adapt to higher sea levels due to climate change, we also face the daunting task of how to protect the past from those rising waters. Anthropologist David Anderson at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and his team are shining a light on the fate of historic sites along the U.S. East Coast. From 15,000-year-old Native American sites to the launch pads at Cape Canaveral, treasured historic and cultural spots could be washed away. My colleagues and I did a study just looking at nine southeastern states. It was a paper published in PLOS One, and uh, we looked at about 130,000 archaeological sites by elevation above sea level. And just with a one meter rise in sea level, we're going to lose potentially um, as many as 20,000 of those, including well over 1,000 that are already listed as eligible in the National Register of Historic Places. We're going to lose lots of sites known and many more that we don't know to sea level rise. Well, well give me an example of an historic site that's uh, under immediate threat. Well, a um, classic example is Jamestown, another is St. Augustine, um, another is the Battery in Charleston, South Carolina. Those are all sites that are very close to modern sea level and indeed people are concerned about how even modest increases in sea level will threaten them. Now, how do you determine that they're under threat? I mean, are you just looking at their elevations and comparing that to the estimates for sea level rise and saying, well, uh, this is going to be underwater? I mean, is it that simple? 
Yes, it's actually, our model has been described as a fairly simple model because what we do is, is we look at the elevation of the archaeological site or historic property or building, and then we say, well, what would a one meter rise in sea level do? Would that cover that site, that building? Would it flood it? Uh, it's a very simple model, but it does tell us there are large numbers of sites within a very short distance uh, elevation above a modern sea level. But is this just limited to historic sites? I mean, uh, what about contemporary facilities? You know, I'm thinking of Kennedy Space Center. That's right there on the Atlantic. I don't imagine it's more than a meter or two above the Atlantic. As a matter of fact, land managers at Kennedy are working on what they call managed retreat, which is basically building buffers, planning for the future, trying to prevent shoreline erosion from occurring, looking at areas further inland, building dunes, stabilizing them with grasses. It is of concern for them. So does that mean that its ability as a launch facility goes away? I mean, you know, the pads are at ground level. Yes. And in fact, that's what land managers are working at. They're trying to prevent flooding from, say, extreme weather events, storm surges. That's why you would build barriers dune ridges along the uh, ocean margin, looking at areas further inland and at higher elevation, those are areas of concern. And we're coming up on 50 years since the launch from Pad 19 of the first lunar landing mission. These are tremendously iconic and historic sites that need or should be protected. Now, you've talked about historic sites. Uh, You know, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, and, uh, you know, that was all pretty much a swamp before they started developing it at the end of the 18th century. And the White House is probably not very far above sea level either. (laughs) Is someplace like that also under threat? Well, in the long term, yes. The White House is actually at about 50 feet. The Lincoln Memorial is about 30 to 35 feet. So that's much further out. All this depends on, of course, whether and when sea level rises to a certain amount. And what we do is is we just go with projections that climatologists put forth. And the current best thinking is roughly a meter in the next century, and then perhaps as many as three to five meters in the century or so after that. So we don't claim to say this is when seas will rise. What we're saying is is that historic properties, archaeological and historic resources, need to be a part of the planning for the long term. What are the options here? I mean, very naively, you know, you might think, okay, well, if Jamestown's under threat, it's right there on the river, we'll just put a a wall around the whole place. Or, uh, I don't know, if that's not practical, maybe you could move the whole thing inland 20 miles or something like that. Uh, or, of course, you could just say, well, it's gone and abandon it. What what determines whether a site is considered for walling off or, or moving or simply giving up? Well, at this point, we've just begun to be thinking about this. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to fix it all. We're going to have to make hard choices because the, the problem is global in scale. It's immense. It's affecting the entire coastal margin of the planet. So what we have to do is is we have to come up with effective means of planning, mitigation procedures, uh, what sites are important, which ones are perhaps unique, which ones are less important. There will be a triage that will have to occur. And and as a profession, people around the world in archaeology and historic preservation are starting to think about this. But we have a long way to go. Now, you've mentioned thousands of sites. You know, the estimates for the rise in sea level vary from something like 2 feet to 10 feet or even more. Is that estimate of how many sites will be affected at the low end or the high end of that scale? Our study shows that there are approximately 20,000 known archaeological and historic sites that are within 1 meter or about 3 feet of modern sea level at present. That's only the recorded or the known sites. The actual number is far greater than that. Can you give me an example of some site that, uh, you know, faces this possible fate? Uh, Maybe it's a certain fate and uh, what the choices are, whether people have studied the choices in that particular case? Well, a classic example is the Hatteras Lighthouse. That was moved a couple thousand feet away from the modern shoreline about 15, 18 years ago. And it's now at about 10 feet, but that's an example of where a tremendous monument, a tremendous structure was moved. It was an incredible effort, Uh, was moved inland. And we know we can do that. We know we can disassemble and reassemble 
major historic properties, buildings, structures, things like that. For archaeological sites, it would take excavation, recovery of information from them. It's, it's very hard to move, things like that. This also affects landscapes, battlefields, cemeteries. I mean, these are issues. There are 100,000 cemeteries in the U.S., and thousands of them are within a fairly short distance of the coast. So those are all things that will have to be considered. And, and what we were arguing in our paper in PLOS One last year was we need to be thinking about this systematically. We need to be building the large informatic structures, the large databases, linking together the information that's out there so we can begin thinking and planning a little more effectively than one state, one agency, one park at a time. I think it's one of the greatest challenges we face as a, a profession and indeed as a civilization is how are we going to deal with the record of our history that is threatened. Dave Anderson, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and um, let's hope that uh, we have a happy future. David Anderson is an anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and a link to his team's paper of how sea level rise threatens archaeology sites can be found on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Plus, there you'll also find a link to an interactive website where you can generate maps of North America where people were living up to 15,000 years ago. As Dr. Anderson said, as the water rises, we have to make tough decisions about what to save and what to abandon. But could our reconciliation with higher seas also present an opportunity? Possible engineering solutions next. It's New Water Worlds on Big Picture Science. While it's possible to move some archaeological artifacts and sites away from the water, modern cities are resolutely fixed in place. We can't collapse San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge or roll up the Esplanade theaters in Singapore or take apart the Brooklyn Bridge like an Ikea desk and haul it all to higher ground. We are stuck, or at least our buildings are. That doesn't mean that we're without options. Humans once lived in harmony with, and with considerable deference to, the oceans and rivers. As climate change raises the water level on our shores and threatens to drown our cities, some city planners are wondering if we can find a way to live in harmony once again. Our need to adapt and find innovative engineering solutions may even present an opportunity, says journalist Jeff Goodell. He's cataloged some of the solutions proposed to hold back rising seas. Some ideas are promising, others are too fanciful or costly for widespread use. The Dutch, of course, can provide infrastructure solutions that will give us guidance, but any idea we implement begins with changing our fixed mindset. We have never thought about this. You know, We've never thought, oh, we need to build this city with the idea that these boundaries between land and sea are going to change, and we need to build in an adaptable way. We have never really thought about, oh, Let's try to build kind of with water. I mean, Venice is obviously one example of a city that I write about in the book. And I went there and I had been there before, of course, but going back there with the, in the context of thinking of it as a water city, my first thought was, you know, this is so beautiful. This is so wonderful. We should have built all of our cities on the water. I mean, it's, you know, it's so great. Of course, Venice has many of its own problems. You tell the story of uh, coming across the opera house <laughs> when archaeologists dug down, they found Marco Polo's house, and then they went down and they found more and more foundations from earlier centuries. So Venice has just been building up and up and up. Yeah. I, I talked to, I spent some time with the chief engineer of the city, and, and he basically pointed out that they can't do that anymore. And, you know, before in the 15th, 16th century, they just would have knocked everything down and built on top of the foundations. They were just like, oh, that's Marco Polo's house. We'll just put, you know, We'll just put a McDonald's on top of it and it'll be fine, you know? Okay, just to be clear, there is no McDonald's on top of <laughs> no, Marco no, Polo's no, house. No. Okay. <laughs> well, 
that brings us to adaptive strategies. And if I can just kick off with one, I think you you discount right away, which is why don't we just build a seawall around the United States and all the countries that are vulnerable? Right. Let's start with that. What's wrong with that idea? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, the idea of building seawalls around a country are crazily expensive. So putting the money part of it aside, when you build a seawall, as anyone's ever been to a seawall knows, you kill the coastal ecosystem. There is no coastal ecosystem anymore. And walls and barriers sound good until you get the storm that overbreaches them. And, you know, the big movement right now among landscape architects, urban planners, coastal defense thinkers is away from walls, away from, that's a very kind of 20th century idea. It's actually a, like a 15th century idea, but except for in, in particular places where, you know, for like lower Manhattan, it makes a certain kind of sense. But in general, it's more towards, uh, instead of walling off water, it's more about how do we think about how to live with water. Can you give an example of that? What, what, what seems to be emerging as, as the most promising technology? And, and are you able to do it without talking about the Dutch city of Rotterdam, which you're welcome to do, but I'm guessing that that is one city that knows what it's doing in terms of living with water. Yeah, I mean, so it's a whole variety of ideas. Rotterdam has, has done things like, you know, these public squares that, that double as sort of water collection areas uh, so that that when there's a big rainstorm or a flood, it's collected in these areas and can be retained there and drained off later, elevating streets, elevating uh, structures so that when the water comes in, it doesn't you know get into the critical infrastructure of places and, and changing the building materials so that they can be inundated with salt water and not be so much of a problem. But there's you know a lot of ways of thinking about this. So there's an interesting project that came out of the Rebuild by Design competition in New York after Hurricane Sandy, where you have uh, on uh, the coast of Staten Island a, a sort of what the architect calls a, a kind of living breakwater, where you have a classic breakwater out, you know, some distance off from the coast, but it's specially designed to bring a lot of marine life and a lot of habitat, you know, coastal kind of habitat. And then you have a sort of safe area behind the breakwater. And the idea is to encourage people to interact with the water and not be afraid of it and fish and swim and 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 become sort of water people in a way that, you know, it's it's almost like a psychological thing, you know. Well, the subject of money hangs over all of these adaptive strategies. And Peter Thiel, the founder of, of PayPal, is behind um, or part of this organization, I think, at the Seasteading Institute, whose goal is to create this floating island. And I'm wondering how you go about building a floating island. How would you build a floating island? Well, they're working on that right now. I mean... That group is working in Fiji. You know, one of the problems with building a floating island is that the seas are rough and, you know, building any kind of stable structure, even if you're using, as you can see with oil drilling derricks and things, it's, it requires this enormous, you know, infrastructure to be steady out in, out in the seas. And even then you have problems. And well, what uh, do you build it on? Well, I mean, uh, their ideas are doing it on pilings. You know, you sink a piling down and you're basically building it on stilts, just not so different than the houses that I visited in Lagos. Or oh, so they are permanent. I mean, so they are, they have some stability. They are yeah. permanent. They're not floating like cruise ships. Right, right. No. But there are people who have ideas about actual floating structures also. Right. But the fact that they're doing this off the coast of Fiji, does that mean that they're doing it with the idea of island nations in mind, that maybe some of the people whose islands will go underwater will have access to these floating islands? Are they really for the billionaires of this world? I think right now they're really for, if not billionaires, the people who can afford to do this. They're not thinking in a sort of philanthropic mode. Um, and I, and, I, and I think that that's understandable because I think that there's a, a you know, it's going to take some investment uh, to figure out how to make all this work. And if you really want to be self-sustainable, how do you grow food? You know, all these, there's lots of implications to this that are quite complex and you know you need to start somewhere. And so it doesn't surprise me that this is a sort of rich person's fantasy right now. But I do have to say that there are lots of architects and people who are building cheap floating houses and there's a guy in Mexico who built a, a house with like I don't know 30,000 like plastic coke bottles lashed together that he lives on and he even has trees planted on it and stuff I mean one of the wonderful things about this is that you know kind of creativity that, that people have I mean people are like 
this is going to unleash, and it already is unleashing a lot of, of creativity and different ways of thinking. What about the idea of raising a city up? Now, you've talked a little bit about that, but you describe a project of the mid-19th century in which they raised the buildings of Chicago up because the city was too close to Lake Michigan and prone to flooding. And I wonder if you could describe it just briefly. And then why can't we raise all our cities up the way they did Chicago over well, 100 years ago. In theory, we can. Uh, but first of all, it's important to point out that this Chicago that was raised is not the Chicago you think of today. This was a <laughs> Chicago. There was dirt roads. 20,000 people or something lived there. There was not very many structures. There were not cable lines and No skyscrapers. Lines. Right. So... So, but they did. You know, they realized that it was, you know, too close to the lake, and they were having problems with with sewage drainage. And instead of and instead of burying sewage lines, they decided to lay the sewage lines on the street and then just raise the city up. And they did it with corkscrew, with men with like corkscrew jacks. But it's not rocket science doing that. I mean, it's you know, you it's a big task, but it doesn't require like inventing gamma ray guns or something. It's just something that we know how to do. But it also doesn't really solve the problem because. You can raise your house and you can put your house 30 feet up in the air and you're going to be okay, but you're going to be living 30 feet up in the air in a flooded world. So you have all this infrastructure that needs to be kind of raised and dealt with also for it to be a kind of functioning city the way we think about it. Well, finally, I want to pick up on the thread of opportunity. And it is a, an optimistic note that's in your in your book um, that is otherwise filled with detail that is quite sobering. And in fact, if we are relearning our relationship with the water, we may find as we go forward creative ways we can live with the water and we might be better for it. Well, I, I think that, you know, we are going to have to redesign how we live on the coast. We're not going to leave the coast. People love water. And it is a great opportunity because it's not like what we've done on the coast is like perfect. You know, we've done a lot of dumb stuff and built stuff in dumb places and in dumb ways. And this is a great opportunity to learn, to think differently about all of this and to reinvent our world and take the lessons from some of these simpler cultures that I talked about at the Calusa Indians or even the people who live in the slums in Lagos uh, who have lived in this more adaptable, more kind of, I hate this word, but natural way, more in harmony with the world, more more in tune with the rhythms of, of nature, which is what we're kind of broadly talking about here. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because I feel like it's important to address this, to talk about this, to think about this, and not just put our heads in the sand and pretend that this is not happening. The book is called The Water Will Come, because it's coming. No matter what we do with carbon emissions, no matter if we all ride skateboards to work, it's all our SUVs, but the amount of heat that's built up in the atmosphere means the glaciers are going to be melting, the water is going to be right. We're going to have to deal with this. And the sooner we start thinking about this, you know, the better off we'll be. And you can't put your head in the sand if the sand is under a foot of water. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Jeff Goodell, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Jeff Goodell is a journalist and the author of The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and the Remaking of the Civilized World. So what we've heard in the show is we're past the point of debating whether the waters are going to rise. Now we're uh, debating, well, by how much, and what are we going to do about it? That's really the big question. And I think what's possibly encouraging here is that it's being recognized as being the big question. And we have to, we can look to the past as a way of shaking ourselves loose from our fixed mindset about being fixed in place. There was a time when humans were more nimble, they were more mobile. Maybe we can't be that way now, but we can make, perhaps find some adaptive solutions that incorporate a flexibility and will allow us to keep the water at bay. Yes. I think that there's always been a premium on flexibility, adaptability when it comes to survival for any species. And humans like to pride themselves on being especially adaptable. Well, we're just going to have to call on that talent of ours. Thanks to the team members who always rise to the level of excellence in helping produce the show, senior producer Gary Niederhoff and operations manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky-David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. 
Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the behavior of rings around planets. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called New Water Worlds. If you want to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. You can also find links there to our guests. 